name's Margaret McCullough. I'm a master's student at the University of Maine, where I've been working on a series of research projects looking into various weed management strategies for organic grain growers operating in New England. In the upcoming narrated presentation, I'll be discussing some of my research into cultivation and a cropping strategy called band sowing for the management of weeds in cereal crops. So thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the following talk. At the bottom of this slide, I've provided my contact information. So for folks who may have questions about any of the material that's provided, please feel free to send along an email. Throughout grad school, myself and my advisor, Eric Gallant, have been working in collaboration with Heather Darby and her colleagues at the University of Vermont to investigate various weed management strategies for organic small grain growers. And while we've seen a big increase in demand for locally grown organic cereals here in the northeastern United States, growing small grains organically certainly does not come without its challenges. The foremost production challenge that organic growers here in New England are facing is definitely weeds and their management. So this is one of my favorite photos illustrating the severity of weed pressure that some growers are up against. And unfortunately, this is not a photograph of a nice crop of canola, but rather a field of spring wheat that's really heavily infested with a particularly troublesome weed for a lot of growers, wild radish or raffinus raffinistrum. Here's another photo where we're looking down into a crop canopy in a different grower's field. And here we have a different sort of weed problem. Instead of just one species, there are many species contributing to this grower's weed infestation. Heavy weed infestations like these threaten to reduce yields and grain quality. They can interfere with harvest and also create conditions within that crop canopy that are conducive to crop diseases taking hold. So in the work that's presented in the remainder of this PowerPoint, we've tried to improve upon the performance of our region's standard practice for growing organic grain crops. Since as we've seen in the last two slides, that cropping strategy that growers are currently using is not really doing a good enough job at managing weeds. Our region's standard practice that most growers utilize is to plant using a standard grain drill that sows the crop in single file rows at what is a moderate row spacing of six to seven inches apart. For physical weed control, harrows, or particularly tine harrows, are utilized for both pre- and post-emergence applications if weather permits. Tine harrows can be a highly effective tool given ideal conditions, However, harrows also have their drawbacks. So each post-emergence tine harrow application is going to result in damage being done to the crop. And when soils are wet or when weeds surpass the white thread stage, thus becoming better established in the soil, tine harrow's efficacy begins to drop off quite rapidly. And as we saw in the previous two slides, growers are often facing weed pressure and weed species that tine harrowing alone does not provide satisfactory weed control for. In research that was previously conducted at the University of Maine, two cropping strategies were identified as superior methods for controlling weeds when compared with our region's standard practice. The first of those improved strategies is a narrow row high density planting. So in this case, row spacing is decreased and seeding rate is elevated. This adjustment to the crop spatial arrangement and density is leveraged to increase the incidence of crop weed competition and thus suppress the growth of weeds. The second improved strategy is a wide row system where the row spacing is increased from that of the standard practice to accommodate inter-row hoeing throughout crop growth. In essence, this is growing and cultivating a cereal crop, much like a row crop. A third strategy that has caught our attention, but whose efficacy for controlling weeds has yet to be formally quantified, is a strategy called band sowing. And this is a system that we saw this innovative farmer, this fellow Lars Askling, utilizing to grow organic grains in Sweden. So Lars, like many growers in Northern Europe, had intractable problems with perennial weed species. And after first finding improved weed management with the adoption of a wide row system with inter-row hoeing, 
He continued to experiment with the way that he was growing his grains to try and achieve even better weed control. So this is where he began to utilize the band sowing strategy, where instead of planting in a single file row, he extended that row to a five inch band and employed aggressive physical weed control by hoeing between the bands throughout crop growth. Lars has also begun to develop equipment, namely the system chameleon that's shown in this photo here. And this machine is equipped to both plant the crop precisely in bands, and then by utilizing a camera guidance system, the same machine returns to the field to precisely hoe between the bands. What we found to be so intriguing about the band sewing strategy is that it essentially leverages the two tactics that are separately making the narrow row high density system and the wide row system function independently as improved weed management strategies. So within the intraband zone, by adjusting the crop spatial arrangement to one that's more uniform, thus giving each individual crop plant more space when compared with row planting, where the crop is tightly packed within a single file row, we elevate the incidence of interspecific competition, or competition occurring between the crop and weeds, and thus suppress weed growth within that band. Then within the interband zone, we have improved physical weed control when compared with the region's standard practice, since we're utilizing more aggressive cultivation sweeps. I'll also mention that one of the reasons that Lars came to prefer the band sowing crop arrangement to that of the wide row system was that it allowed for him to cultivate much closer to where the crop is growing. And I'll walk through that and show that with the help of some diagrams in the next few slides. So here we can imagine that we're looking down from above on a field that is planted in wide rows, as is shown on the left, and then on the right, a field that is planted using the band sowing strategy. And within both fields, we'll inevitably have weeds that are represented here by the red stars. So when farmers go through and cultivate, what Lars observed many growers doing when they were utilizing the wide row system is that by aggregating their crop into these densely packed rows, growers were then leaving an ample amount of space on either side of the row left uncultivated in order to reduce the risk of taking out the crop row. What this does and what this slide illustrates is that within that uncultivated area next to the row, weeds get left behind to compete with the crop. With band sowing, however, the crop is spread out over a much larger area within that five inch band. And therefore, farmers don't have to worry as much about taking out a huge number of their crop plants in case of a misguidance of that cultivation equipment. This allows growers to cultivate right up to the very edge of the band, possibly sacrificing a few plants on the edge, but achieving superior weed control within that interband zone. And that brings us to our research. So we have this innovative strategy that growers are beginning to adopt and experiment with in Northern Europe. And we want to ask the question of whether we could adapt that system to work for grain growers in Maine and throughout the rest of New England. So while we didn't have the funds to bring a system chameleon home with us from Sweden, we did retrofit some of our existing equipment in order to be able to perform the band sewing strategy. So we outfitted this Vicon air seeder with planting sweeps capable of seeding a crop in five inch bands. And then we would return with a separate piece of equipment, a Schmatzer cultivator that you can see is human guided to perform the interband cultivation. So in the field research that we conducted, we wanted to test whether the band sowing practice would provide superior weed control when compared with the region's standard practice employed by the majority of growers in New England. And then we also wanted to compare the band sowing performance with that of the two previously identified uh, strategies, the narrow row high density planting and the wide row planting with inter row hoeing. Within this experiment, we tested five cropping systems or treatments, and our test crop for all of them was spring barley of a popular variety called Newdale. Also, all treatments received post-emergence tine harrowing when conditions permitted. 
The first treatment, our standard treatment, is representative of our region's standard growing practice. So we planted at a target population of 325 plants per square meter and at a row spacing of six and a half inches. The second treatment is representative of one of our improved strategies, the narrow row high density planting, where row spacing was decreased to four and a half inches. And this treatment is the only one in which the target plant population is altered from that 325 plants per square meter. And in this case, it was increased to a population of 500 plants per square meter. The third treatment is representative of our second improved strategy, the wide row system with inter-row hoeing. And in this treatment, row spacing was increased to nine inches, and the plus symbol at the end of this treatment's name, wide plus, indicates that inter-row hoeing was performed with five inch sweeps. We then included two band sewn treatments. In both, crop bands were five inches in width and six inches was left between the bands. This fourth treatment, named band, received no interband cultivation. While the band plus treatment did receive interband cultivation with five inch sweeps. Because ambient weeds, or weeds that are naturally occurring in the experimental field, have complex seed dormancies and are quite patchy in nature, in order to ensure that a uniform population of weeds existed throughout the experiment that we could then monitor, we actually planted a surrogate weed. And in this case, we planted a variety of condiment mustard called Ida Gold mustard throughout the entirety of our experiment at a target plant population of 65 plants per square meter. This experiment was performed at two sites, one in Northern Vermont and one in Central Maine, over two years, 2016 and 2017. Our experimental design was a randomized complete block design, and depending on space available during each site year, either four or five blocks or replications of each experiment were tested. Also in the data I'll present in the upcoming slides, ANOVA and Fisher's protected LSD were used to perform means comparisons. Just prior to harvesting the crop, we went out and collected samples of the surrogate weed mustard's biomass and recorded its dry weight as a measure of the performance of each of our treatments. My hypothesized or expected outcome of how each of these treatments would perform is that our region's standard practice would have the highest end of season weed biomass. The two improved weed management strategies would have significantly less weed biomass. I hypothesized that the band sown strategy without interband cultivation would perform about as equally as well to the improved strategies and that the band sown treatment with interband cultivation would perform superior to all other strategies, thus having the least end of season weed biomass. So let's have a look at what happened in this field experiment. For this experiment, each site year was analyzed separately. So therefore, on this slide, we're looking again at the surrogate weed biomass along the y-axis, and then our five treatments are along the x-axis. But we'll view the results for each site and year of the experiment separately. So here we have our results from Maine in 2016. These bar graphs are showing the mean or average surrogate weed biomass from each of the treatments. And those letters that are on top of each of the bars is what is called a connecting letters report. So if bars or treatments share a common letter, that shows that they have means that are not statistically different from one another. Those that do not share a common letter are statistically different from one another. If we look at the results from this site year, we can see that the band plus treatment on the far right performed equally as well in reducing surrogate weed biomass when compared with the standard treatment since they share letters. Also in this site year, the narrow row high density treatment performed best, having significantly less in end of season weed biomass than all other treatments. At the Vermont site in 2016, we saw no significant differences in end of season surrogate weed biomass. In Maine of 2017, we had really superb ideal conditions for tine harrowing, which resulted in a high level of weed control across all of the treatments, and thus no significant differences amongst the treatments. 
And in Vermont of 2017, we did see that the Band Plus treatment reduced weed biomass when compared with a standard treatment. However, it performed equally as well as the remaining three treatments. So ultimately, our hypothesis that the Band Plus treatment would perform superior to the standard practice was not supported since in only one out of four site years did it actually do so. In addition, this experiment did not support our hypothesis that the band plus treatment would perform better than the narrow high density and the wide plus treatments, since in three out of four years it performed equally as well, and in Maine of 2016, the narrow high density treatment did even better. Another reason that we were excited by the prospect of bringing band sowing to New England was the possibility for it to be used to grow multiple crops. So in a second field experiment, we asked the question of whether the band sowing strategy could be utilized to grow other small grains and alternative field crops. In this experiment, we again wanted to ask whether it would perform better at managing weeds when compared with the region standard practice. This experiment was only conducted at the main site, but was repeated in 2016 and 2017. Here we only included two treatments, the region's standard practice for growing each of the crops that we tested, and the band plus treatment or band sowing with interband cultivation. These two treatments were then tested in four different crops, spring wheat, oats, field peas, and flax. So here again we have end of season surrogate weed biomass weights for both 2016 and for 2017 and for all four of our alternative crops. The dark blue bars are showing mean biomass for the standard treatment, and the light blue bars are showing the same for the band plus treatment. When we tested whether the difference in observed surrogate weed biomass were statistically different, we used a pooled t-test to compare means. If those p-values from that test are lesser than 0.05, we would call those results statistically different from one another. So here you can look at those p-values in the upper left-hand corner of each box, and those that are statistically different are marked by an asterisk following the reported p-value. So in this experiment, I find it really encouraging that for three out of four crops in each experimental year, we see a pattern of lesser end of season weed biomass with the band sowing strategy. And as you can see, that difference is not always significant, but I still find the trend to be encouraging. And what I ultimately take away from this experiment is that we have some evidence that the band sowing strategy may be able to provide superior weed control when compared with our region standard practice. To wrap things up, I want to share some of my thoughts for future projects that may continue to investigate band sowing. So first, based on how we saw band sowing perform in the alternative crops experiment and in Northern Europe, I do believe that it's still worthwhile to continue and try and optimize band sowing as a cropping strategy for growers here in New England. However, as we saw in the barley experiment, the effect of tine harrowing given ideal conditions can be quite profound, and I believe that it would have been better if we had introduced tine harrowing as a split plot treatment so that effects could be analyzed both with and without harrowing. I would also love to see how band sowing, as well as our two improved strategies, might perform and hold up in situations with really intense weed pressure. So like what area growers are experiencing on farm and like what we saw in the first two slides. So bringing these strategies into on farm trials, I think would be really interesting to see how they perform. A last thing that I wanted to touch upon is that within these experiments, only one seeding rate was tested for the band sowing strategy. So therefore, another area for investigation would be into whether augmenting variables such as seeding rate, bandwidth, and interbandwidth could result in better performance of the band sowing strategy. Last but not least, I'd like to extend a big thanks to all those folks who have helped with this work, of which there are many as well as the funders of this research, whose information is shown at the bottom of this slide. I'll end by reminding you all that my contact info is on the first slide of this PowerPoint, and if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email.